Well, yesterday was the 4th of July, a date on the calendar that has preeminence in America. Uh, by the way, your uh, bulletin, one looks just like this, on the inside of the trifold, on the right-hand side, there's an outline for today's message and some fill-in-the-blanks. Why are there fill-in-the-blanks? Because you know what? Psychological studies have shown that when the hand writes something, the mind tends to learn it, retain it longer. And I just give you uh, that little fill-in-the-blank outline as a, um, something that you can help remember what was said and also say, hey, I didn't like what he said there. Or I disagree with that or whatever, and you can go back over it. Or if you get home and somebody uh, asks you, hey, what did the pastor preach about today? You have something to go by there. Um, you know, our nation's founding began on that faithful, fateful day in 1776, a hot July 4th in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And those 56 brave patriots who signed that document were risking their lives. Did you realize that? They were signing, really, their own death warrant because this document, which was ferried by ship to London to be presented to the King of England, was really a document of treason against the king's rule, and the penalty for treason was death. In declaring their independence from England and her king, the American people assumed among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. And this month, so we celebrate the 239th birthday of the United States of America, the longest lasting democracy in history. Aspirations for liberty that are voiced in the Declaration found their way into the Constitution of the new United States of America, the aim of which, as stated in the preamble of the Constitution, was to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Those early patriots, you see, had a long-term view of liberty, not a political campaign view. John Adams, second president of the United States, also a signer of the Declaration, said of this yesterday's date, said of July 4th, it ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. These founders of our nation were quite familiar with biblical concepts concerning governance and freedom. So let's take a moment to look at those concepts. Freedom has deep roots in the Bible. The premier story of the Old Testament is of Moses leading the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Did you get that? Out of slavery to freedom in a new land. This liberation from slavery was also understood as a metaphor of liberation from the sin that holds people in bondage. The human heart yearns for freedom, for God created humans in his image, gifted with creativity, dignity, and freedom. And yet, in that freedom, humans chose to disobey God, and so sin entered into the world. Now, if you don't think that is true, take a look at that, what used to be the sign in the front yard of our church. That is an example of freedom, God-given freedom, being abused. Someone drank alcohol or used drugs and got behind the wheel of a powerful machine, <clears throat> exercising their freedom to get behind the wheel, right, and go where they want to go, but abusing that freedom irresponsibly. Bondage by tyranny and slavery is a manifestation of sin. The New Testament is all about God's greatest gift to us, Christ Jesus, who frees us from the shackles and burden of our sin and the resulting guilt. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We don't have to remain as creatures pushed around by our own passions and bad choices. We can make good choices. So it's a biblical worldview that informs our nation's founding. You've heard these famous words. 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That one sentence right there, in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, sets America apart from all the other nations on earth. The value of each person is not derived from government benevolence. Our value is not derived from our place of birth or what family we come from what our ancestral lineage is. Our value isn't even derived from the mercies of democracy. We are not the result of natural causes, but of a supernatural cause. We have dignity and freedom as individuals because it is in our essence, made in the image of God. We hold human lives sacred because God has made us so. That's stated in a founding document of this nation. The founders of our country also recognized that humans are flawed by sin. And so in need of guidance through law to restrain our basest impulses. Liberty in the American ethos does not mean the removal of all immediate constraints. You know, that I can do whatever I want kind of idea of freedom. That would be license, not liberty, resulting in anarchy. People will abuse freedom and all the lives that are enslaved to emotions, passions, prejudices, misinformation, and pride with the resulting unhappiness, misdirected lives, broken families, riots, and crime, attest to this. Absent any restraints, there would be no true freedom. You see, liberty is continually threatened on the one side by anarchy, license, no restraint, and on the other side by tyranny, too much restraint. As the Bible reminds us, do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. If people are not virtuous, then no amount of laws can make them do right. And government intervention will not be able to right all the wrongs. John Adams, as I mentioned earlier, second president of the United States, said that our constitutional form of government is suitable only for a virtuous people and wholly unsuitable for any other. Take away the creator who gave us our freedom and our dignity and the virtues that flow from our creator's guidance, and we are all going to be at the mercy of the powers of the moment. That's the very challenge we face today in America as various people and powers actively undermine faith in God in our society and culture. The great American contribution to the world is securing freedom for its people by reconciling liberty and law. Remember, I said liberty stands in between anarchy and tyranny, reconciling liberty and and law, the Constitution being the primary foundational and primary uh, law of the land. Just as the great song America the Beautiful says, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. The Declaration of Independence clearly states that freedom of individuals is a divine gift, not something that can be granted by kings or presidents, legislatures, or bureaucracies. Therefore, the Constitution outlines a form of government with limited power. Government with limited power, lest it impinge upon divine given freedom. You with me so far? As the Declaration says, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. 
these philosophical understandings find their source in the Bible. I mean, read 2 Samuel when the people of Israel asked for a king. Can't we be like all the other nations and have a king? And the prophet said to them, you don't want a king. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your young men to serve in his labor uh, corps and in his armies. That's what you get from kings. Religion really does form the foundation of our nation and government. That is why religious freedom is America's first freedom. And the Constitution doesn't just guarantee freedom of worship as a private exercise, but full freedom of expression of religion in the marketplace as necessary to ensuring liberty through law. So, the patriots of 1776, in gaining independence from the King of Britain and in drafting a foundation in law, were truly revolutionary. For no other such nation or government existed or had existed in the world. That's why on the money it says, uh, Novum Ordo, New Order. They knew. They're try they call it an experiment. They're trying something that had never happened before in human history. The revolution of self-governance was attacked from the outside and has been steadily undermined by a counter-revolution of so-called progressive policies and professional politicians for the last 100 years. Actually, it goes farther back than that. The limited government of the United States was created by the states to serve the people, protecting the unalienable rights of its citizens and for the purpose of providing the common defense. That's it. We cannot escape the great challenge that faced our forebears when they began constructing a national government that was all at once a republic, a democracy, and a federation. Not easy to hold all those things together. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. People are tempted. Who here has never been tempted to do wrong or to use their position for personal gain? Anybody here never been tempted along those lines? You're not going to admit it, are you? Okay, I have many times. People are tempted. And you know, when you put ambition and avarice, avarice means, you know, like greed, desire for, for wealth. You put those two together in a public office with great power. The temptation to use that office for personal gain is almost irresistible. I mean, who among us could resist the temptations? Government must be limited because sinful people tend to abuse power and position. But what is government but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary, right? And if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary, right? By the way, I didn't make that up. That was written by James Madison in 1780-something or other, 86 or 87, the Federalist Papers, a series of newspaper articles to explain the Constitution to the people of America. No governing system is perfect, and no level of government is flawless. Given that humans are by nature, nature sinful, that would seem obvious to me. So, so why concentrate so much authority in the hands of so few imperfect people? If a large centralized government is so necessary to manage so many aspects of our lives because we, the people, are just not capable, then, then what explains the ability of a small number of politicians and bureaucrats 
to manage the lives of so many people? Are they endowed with some special wisdom that we don't have? Government's first duty is to protect the people, not run their lives. We have a constitutional system to place checks and balances on those flawed individuals to whom we entrust authority to govern. That's why it's there. The Constitution was instituted to preserve the civil society and the individual's unalienable rights. But today, I fear that our federal government, in many respects, operates counter to the American revolution of self-governance. The steady jog toward unbridled, centralized decision-making has become a sprint. The federal government has evolved into a colossus. And the circle of liberty that surrounds each individual is shrinking. You hear people decry all the money that politicians use to get elected and all the money that corporations, oh, by the way, and unions and various other interest groups, movements, put into the electoral process. Why? Because government has so much power over so many aspects of our lives. If they didn't have regulatory power over us, people wouldn't be interested in controlling it. It's pretty simple. When we evict the sacred from our cultural consciousness, we have already begun our way down the road to tyranny and the embodiment of evil. When you destroy the moral law, as secularism has done, you undermine the reason for honoring any law. Because it's like this. You see, the American Constitution was not founded on political atheism but recognizes that human rights and morality come from God. It is not sufficient just to have a law out there for people to obey. There must be an inner urge or a hunger to keep and honor that law because it is good and has a divine origin. Secularism cannot accomplish that because it doesn't have a divine origin. And it will always find ways to circumvent and misuse the law rather than revere it. In contrast, Christianity says to us, live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. When leaders and people disregard the law, liberty withers on the vine. When people neglect the morality which forms the basis for law and no longer live in self-control, then liberty is imperiled for everyone. Where laws end, tyranny begins. I have to say, I'm kind of pessimistic right now about the prospects for our children and great-grandchildren to enjoy the blessings of liberty and the great opportunities and prosperity that the American Revolution first began. The preamble to the Constitution says to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and for our posterity. I love that phrase, for ourselves and our posterity. Everybody know what posterity means? That means your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. It means the next generations coming after us. It speaks of a vision that outlasts the momentary pursuits of the present generation. To neglect the blessings of liberty for future generations because, because of our present desires is really a selfish and destructive pursuit. To place a burden of debt upon future generations in order to satisfy or bribe the current generation is really an immoral squandering of the blessing of liberty. It's using our freedom to abuse future generations' freedom. It seems that, now I'm speaking here, my opinion, it seems that too many of our politicians think only of the next election, not the next generation. And it's hard for them to get past that because they're in a system that's all wound up in that. I heard someone comment to me the other day that Washington, D.C. is starting to look more and more like the Capital District in the Hunger Games. Yeah. 
And you know what? Too many voters are easily swayed by promises of government largesse today. All for good causes, of course. To good, do good for more people. And they don't think about the disaster it produces tomorrow. And tomorrow was already here. Look at the country of Greece. Need to inform yourself on what's going on there. Fiscal collapse. Well, you know, you don't think about that. Fiscal collapse, that's just a term out there. It impacts daily lives. Hey, how would you feel if tomorrow all the banks were closed and you could go to the ATM and get $100 only? And the bank stayed closed, and that $100, that's it, until the banks reopen. The day, and the banks are closed for 10 straight days. Would you like it? Anybody here like that? That's what's happened in Greece. So I tell you, these things have impact on daily lives. Yet a profound, a profound reliance on God teaches us to value that which is eternal. I like C.S. Lewis, the great English author, who said, all that which is not eternal is forever out of date. God teaches us to value the eternal, to guard those values, and to pass them on to our posterity. You know, I, I tend to think that it is those who have a healthy understanding of the past are the ones who are best able to prepare for the future. Many people who ignore their heritage do so not so much out of a willfulness as from a chronic disinterest in history. The context of the past, though, is imperative if we're to salvage the future. The only thing that's worse than nostalgia is amnesia. And everything new is not always good. Doesn't mean everything old is good. It's just that there's a lot of good that we can find from the past. The waning of Christianity and Christian values is part and parcel of the diminishing of our liberty in this country. Again, my opinion, but I hold firmly to that. When morals and ethics are determined by political expedience and power, pushed by the winds of changing human desires, we will surely lose our freedoms because those winds will change again. I fear this has been happening at a rapid pace in our lifetimes. As it says in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Looks good today, may not be so good tomorrow. God provides, though, a blueprint of what life is intended to be. I, I think Jesus of Nazareth is the picture of the most liberated man who ever walked this earth. He framed his life in accordance with divine morality and his faith and obedience to that never stifled his freedom. Read it, Gospel of John. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. In his commands, he shows us what we must do. And in his person, he shows us what we will become. And through his Holy Spirit, he transforms us. Freedom is more than being happy. And it's even more than choosing a code of conduct. It has to do with the kind of people we are and are becoming. That's why I say that our freedom must be rooted in God and the morality that flowers from those roots, or it is no freedom at all. Observe history. I wish more people would observe history, or even, even current events, if, if you will, and you will find this that where God is marginalized or even banished from the life of a people, nations slide further towards suppression of freedom and into tyranny. 
in 1776, there was a revolution in America, but it was a revolution in human thinking, a revolution for self-governance under the guidance of God and laws. In 1790, there was a revolution in France, but without the guidance of God. In fact, it was a revolution that explicitly wanted to banish God from the human life and marketplace. Yes, there was bloodshed stemming from 1776, but ultimately won freedom for this great nation and reconciliation with Britain. 1790s revolution in France led within three years to the use of the guillotine in the public square and the streets of Paris ran with blood. And within a few years of that, they were ruled by a dictator. Banishing God, marginalizing God, leads to tyranny and evil. And that's why it's important for us on our nation's celebration of independence to remember these four things. Our true freedom comes from God. Never forget that. Freedom is the work of, whole, of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Freedom begins with each one of us. And our nation's freedom depends on all of us. As did those who signed the Declaration, so too we know that our dignity and freedom are preserved in the richness of a people who trust in God. These truths we must hand on to our children and grandchildren. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If you have not yet given your life to our risen Lord, your freedom still awaits you. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.